Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and the reason that it has taken me this long to get my video done today is because I have literally been listening to hours of video to find the little clips that I found interesting this morning, so it took me a while to put this together. Um, as far as uh, the market and how the market crashed yesterday, all of these things, if you if you have been listening and you truly understand what this is all about and what utility means and what where we're going with Ripple and XRP, then the market crashing, I don't care how bad it crashed, the market crashing is nothing but an opportunity for you. And that, I'm in fact, I'm waiting myself. Um, I had transferred some uh, money from one of my Roth IRAs. I had transferred more into my Roth IRA with iTrust Capital so that I could buy XRP in that uh, at these discounted prices and buy as much as possible that will be tax free when I when and if I ever sell it. And so I've been trying to position myself to buy more um, that the stuff that happened yesterday where people are selling because they're freaked out in general it's just that's just people that don't understand they either they, those are either people that had no choice but to sell and maybe they were leveraged or whatever or it's people that are just scared and they don't understand or they or or it's people who did what we've always said not to do which is they bought more than they could afford to lose and they were put in a position where they needed the money to live and that's not the kind of investing i talk about here anyway okay now let's get going I'm, this is going to be a long video but i'm going to show you like i always say what happened yesterday that's little picture that's tiny stuff what and i don't care i know it's painful i don't I, don't get me wrong i don't like seeing um I don't like seeing the market tank and all that, but if you really understand what this is all about, it doesn't mean anything. Like Glenn Hutchins said, the market as you see it right now on coin market cap is a distraction because it's all speculation. If we're right, and I do believe I'm right, if we're right and the utility of XRP kicks in, what's on coin market cap is a joke. Okay, it doesn't mean anything. So he is right. All right, let's start with Cryptopolis. Now, Cryptopolis, for those of you that don't know, is has about 30 plus years in the trading market, traditional markets uh, trading. I think he's even created software for trading. Um, and he has, you know, tons of experience and very smart guy. I've met him. 1929 to 1932 playbook. He is comparing what's going on in the markets to the depression, the Great Depression. Um, he says, we are here rebound coming and he's looking at like the rebound we see today but he's saying we have major legs down okay now to me i mean i ever since the financial crisis i haven't really invested in the stock market much anyway because i don't trust all of what, what they're doing i've always felt like it was just a bubble they were blowing up so it's kind of irrelevant to me in that respect and but but the fear overall affects us all temporarily but yes temporarily i said it okay um here is steve mnuchin from the white house this morning i, I think that it's important i just wanted to kind of start this video with a backdrop of where we are okay this is what steve mnuchin and more importantly what the problem is and remember here's the problem Every time we get in a financial crisis situation, it, the problem is liquidity. Okay, all these banks, everything freezes up. That's the problem, liquidity. What is the problem that, that Ripple has said from the very beginning that it solves? It, it solves two problems, liquidity and settlement, which kind of go hand in hand. Listen to what Mnuchin said in this video. And he joins us now live first on CNBC. Mr. Secretary, thank you for finding the time to speak to us. How are the negotiations going with the Speaker of the House? 
Jim, it's great to be here with you, and the negotiations are going very well. This has been a bipartisan effort. Uh, I spoke to the president and vice president over 10 times yesterday to go through the issues and get direction. I've spoken to Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy constantly, spoke to them both already this morning as well as the speaker, and I think we're very close to getting this done. This is a very important bill for small and medium-sized businesses. Okay, I'm sorry, but I had to cut off that Steve Mnuchin video because he said the word that for some idiotic reason that, that we're not allowed to say on YouTube. So, I mean, to this day, it's so crazy that, that we, we're not allowed to say certain words. That, to me, that's not the America I grew up in. But anyway, um, so so here we are. Um, and but, but I want to make sure you understand the point. The problem that Steve Mnuchin, the Secretary of the Treasury, is having to solve in the White House, the problem that happens in these crises is liquidity. They've got to free up liquidity. They're injecting all kinds of things into the system. That is what XRP and Ripple are for the purposes of solving. I don't think any of this is by coincidence. I want to give you a flashback here. This is from Ben Bernanke on 60 Minutes back in the day when he was explaining. He says, for those who might be wondering, where did the Federal Reserve get the $1.5 trillion they just committed to ingesting, uh, injecting a blast from the past explanation of how it all works? Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. We simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account. So in other words, they hit the digital print button. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. All right. And now I wanted to show you this. This is something I tweeted out yesterday. Well, every time we get in one of these emergency type situations, it always reminds me of what Rahm Emanuel. Remember, Rahm Emanuel was White House Chief of Staff, I think, for Obama back in 2009-2010. He was also the advisor. He was one of the core advisors, I believe, to the Clintons through a lot of their political careers. And this guy's one of the he's known as one of the most ruthless political uh, uh, political people. He's, I think he's now he now he might be the mayor of, of uh, Chicago now, but he's known to be one of the most uh, ruthless political operatives that there is now. I'm not showing you this to tell you that I think the current situation was somehow manufactured from the government. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm showing this to show, to tell, to let you know is these, po the, these people in, in Washington and the money people, the people that run the world, they're all political animals. And so what you read here is exactly the way they view things like this. You never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that is an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. Okay, remember, and what this reminds me of. Do you remember when Libra announced, when Facebook announced the Libra coin? Remember when Brad Garlinghouse got on stage and he said, "You know, I wanted to send the guy, the Libra creator, a, a case of wine because the second they announced that, all of these bankers and central bankers that Ripple had been talking to, all of a sudden." Got all, they were sitting on their hands and all of a sudden they started calling Ripple because they realized Ripple's been trying to tell them this story and now they realize they needed to get off the commode and get it going. Okay. And so that's what I see because remember, um, it's governments and central banks that Ripple has been working with and talking to all, all along. Remember the room full of central bankers that Brad Garlinghouse was doing a presentation for in Switzerland. All of those people were asking questions. I told you I've had some experience in sales and in sales, you learn, you ask questions when you're interested in the product and you, but you have some concerns. Those are, those, if you can answer as a salesman, if you can answer those questions the correct way, then they'll buy your product. Well, if these guys are getting freaked out in this situation here, it could be an opportunity for what uh, many of them have, may have been in denial about all along, which is that Ripple has the solution to this liquidity, like Chris Larson told you. Now, moving along, um, Jim Hyatt makes a very good point. Can we have a discussion about network reliability today or no? All prices are down. But how many transactions are backed up on the XRPL? How many on Ethereum and Bitcoin? The value is in the protocol fundamentals. And this is from yesterday, CZ Binance, Ethereum network congestion. Average time for confirmation is 26 
180 seconds, 44 minutes. So the Ethereum network was congested yesterday. We've seen the same thing happen with Bit the Bitcoin network. What network have we not seen it happen with? That would be the Ripple network, right? Okay. And, and that means something. All right. Now, this is from Stuart XRP. This is a Brad Garlinghouse quote from the past. I have said publicly before that I think 99% of all crypto probably goes to zero. But there is that, that 1% that I think is focused on solving a real problem for real customers and, and is able to do that at scale. When he says do that at scale, he means there's not going to be any network congestion on the Ripple network like Ethereum and Bitcoin. So, and then he all, and also the thing to take out of this is yes, he's predicted that at some point, all of these digital assets don't, that don't have a use case are going to go to zero. So when you see collapses, What's going to happen is eventually the, the money is going to flow to the, the, the digital assets that have real use case. So here it is again. I think now we're seeing increasingly it is focused on solving real problems for real customers. And the, the hype cycle that has driven blockchain, has driven crypto, I think, has slowly abated, you know, partly as measured by the market cap of all crypto being down, you know, roughly 80, 85%. At the end of the day, the value of any digital asset, I believe very strongly be derived by the utility that it delivers. There's a lot of crypto out there that I can't. Okay. So no utility, no value. All right. Now think about this for a minute. We are just now in 2020. Remember, Ripple said 2020 is the year of the digital asset. We are just now entering the phase where utility is going to kick in. That's what I believe. That's why I believe they declared this the year of the digital asset. We've seen the volumes ticking up over the course of the last few months from MoneyGram and, and the Mexican uh, corridor. Now, let's talk. Let's go back to the big picture, folks, and what's been what's been being sold to the people that matter. The, the, <coughs> the lords of finance, the wealthiest people in the world, the people that control the banking systems of the world. Back, We go back to the Economic Club of New York. Th these are the videos I've been watching uh, th this morning. Back to the Economic Club of New York. This, like I said yesterday, this is where the, this is where the masters of the, the financial universe find out the trends and where things are going and they're and they're basically in my opinion sold on what's coming and what they need to be a part of and i believe this has been going on for the last five years now here's what's important um this part right here this is used the new york economic club or the economic club in new york is used as a platform to get agendas done okay Club speakers often use the platform to put forth their agendas to members and the media. On December 14, 1962, then President John F. Kennedy made his famous remarks calling for a sharp cut in taxes and reform of tax systems in order to grow the economy. And this is part of what he said here. I won't go into that, but the point is, is that this is where the rich and powerful, this is where the agenda is proposed and people begin to watch what's going on. So now let's look at what has been, what agendas have been proposed and what's been talked about to this New York Economic Club. I showed you this guy yesterday. Well, first I want to show you. I showed you yesterday, Brian Moynihan, Bank of America, who has been piloting Ripple, right? Brian Moynihan. Well, I saw right, I saw, I showed you a uh, part of this Stanley Druckenmiller, right? He's right beside Brian Moynihan. And then within within four months, they put Anna Boten of Santander on stage. And then the same day, they put Brad Garlinghouse on stage. So I'm going to show you today part of Dr this Stanley Druckenmiller. Remember, this is the guy that helped George Soros bring down the British sterling, I believe. So this guy's a currency expert. OK, so. The, the agenda is, you can see, and I haven't even gone into these others yet, but you can kind of see, if you watch all of these videos, you can kind of see an agenda being sold, okay? So, so, but I just wanted to show you that layout, 
And now let's go this. Remember, this is Stanley Druckenmiller. He's the guy who um, helped uh, George Soros. He managed money for George Soros as the leader, lead manager of the Quantum Fund. And they're the ones that 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 made like two billion dollars um, on um, the British doing something, manipulating something with the British sterling or whatever. Let me hit down here. It says that he, I, I covered it yesterday. Broke the Bank of England when they shorted the British pound sterling in 1992. All right. So here, this is this Stanley Druckenmiller in front of the Economic Club of New York. Let me pull up my notes so I can get the right times here. Okay, here we go. Gold's not, gold's not bad either. Cause... Other questions? Someone else here? And by the way, the guy whose voice you're hearing who introduced him would be, yes, Glenn Hutchins. One of the board of directors of the Digital Currency Group, also the uh, one of the directors of the uh, Federal Reserve Board of New York. I could go down the list of way, the ways he's connected, but he's also the guy that said coin market cap. Those prices are a distraction. The values in the protocol. Uh, in the back row there, gentlemen, and then we'll come over here. In a second. Thanks so much, Stan. Um, Warren Buffett has called Bitcoin rat poison squared. <laughs> On the other side, you have folks like Peter Thiel, who um, I think most people in this audience would agree have done a better job uh, at being ahead of the curve in predicting disruptive technologies. By the way, Peter Thiel's an investor in Ripple. Could you share your thoughts with us about Bitcoin? It probably is one of the few asset classes in the world that has done a better job rallying over the past few months than treasuries? Um, I look at Bitcoin as a solution in search of a problem. Um, I don't understand why we need this thing. And the, the great thing they're out there talking about is a stable um, cryptocurrency. Well, it's, to me, that's called the dollar. Now, if we keep weaponizing um, tariffs and sanctions and everything else we're doing, maybe five or 10 years down the road, but the pro don't play. I don't. I I just don't need to be playing in Bitcoin. Uh, I wouldn't be short it. I wouldn't be long it. Uh, I don't think I'm a Neanderthal, which is what I've been called when I said I didn't want to own Bitcoin. They keep telling me it's going to be a store of value like gold. Maybe I mean it could go to a million, but I don't understand why it's a store of value, other than you can't create it. Well, there's a lot of things you can't create that aren't going to go to a million. So. Okay, so there's what he thinks about Bitcoin. And I found another video of him on CNBC where he talks a little more about what he thinks about Bitcoin. It hinders long-term growth. Companies like this should not be walking around borrowing money. And that's kind of, that's kind of where we are today. You see what's going on in Bitcoin. Um, Do you own any cryptocurrencies? I don't own any. Um, obviously, as a trader, I should have, but I only trade what I know. What I, what I do know is, um, it takes the same amount of energy to do one Bitcoin transaction that it takes to power nine homes in the U.S. By 2019, it'll take up all, it'll take up half the energy in the entire United States to run the Bitcoin network. Sounds like the utility companies are a buy. Yeah. Well, I find it interesting that, that most of the people in Bitcoin are climate people. They're West Coast people. I don't quite get the connection. We've got this rogue currency that we're all going to support um, that is destroying the climate in some extent, but whatever. So you're not going to take a position on whether Bitcoin is going to go up to 100,000 or a million or whatever the, I mean, it, it, if we're talking about bubbles, it must look to you like some of the greatest we've ever experienced. I don't know whether it's the greatest we've ever experienced. Look, Bitcoin is, is like anything else. It's worth what people are willing to pay for it. And right now, people are willing to pay. I haven't looked in the last five minutes, so it could have varied time. But let's say they're willing to pay 17000 That's what it's worth. Um, the tulips were worth when people were paying that for them. Gold is what it's worth. What I do know about Bitcoin is the concept that it could ever be a medium of exchange has been eliminated because you can't do transactions, particularly retail transactions, with something with this kind of volatility. 
But if people think Bitcoin is worth 17000 that's what it's worth today. Last thing on this before we move on. There are people who want to hold Bitcoin for, because they're as critical of the Fed and other central banks as you are. So if they agree with your philosophy that the central banks are screwing this up, then what would be a better way to express that than holding something like Bitcoin? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I think at, at some point figure out when this is going to end and then uh, either get out or go short um, because by the way when this ends and it will I'm talking about this monetary radicalism period we're in uh, Bitcoin will probably go down with the rest of the stuff so are you actively positioned for that now How, uh, what okay so you can kind of see what what he's saying there all right now let's move on and let's go to Anna Boten okay before we talk now remember Anna Boten is the um, uh, CEO of Santander, Banco Santander. Um, but but and, and, and many but many of you and, and they also they use Ripple on their their payment app. Okay, well Anna Boten, it's important that you understand who these people are. So let's go over. She's a Spanish banker. Uh, um, she's appointed executive chairman of the Santander Group. She's a fourth generation of the Boten family to this prior. Um, her I believe her father was, let's see, it says um, her father is a Spanish banker who is the executive chairman of Spain's Grupo Santander and Palomo Shea. She received, um, so anyway, this is her career. She's fourth generation uh, banker, okay? But her husband, and this is her personal life, her husband is this guy, fellow banker, and I'm not even going to try to say his name. He is the he is basically royalty. So these people are they come from banking royalty more or less. And and his what did they say down here? He's the son of the ninth marquis of Borghetto, a wealthy landowner. So these people are major figures. They're like ro banking royalty from around the world. So um, and now I want to make make sure you understand who owns Banco Santander. These two companies here. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are two of the largest owners in Banco Santander, and I think that that's important. Now, um, I went through this entire video. Um, she did about an hour with the Econo Economic Club of New York. Some of you may have seen parts of this, but I went and found every part. Now, every part that's applicable to what we're talking about. Now, here's what I got after listening to this. A couple of things. A, she's very smart. B, I've never seen anybody who's more pro Ripple than this woman in this in these this series of clips that I'm about to show you. And C, she's more or less laying down the gauntlet to the other banks in the United States and saying I'm coming. And and but but the main thing is I've never I have never seen anybody is, who is as pro Ripple as this lady right here. And wait till you see some of these clips. I think it'll all come together. Now, some of these are longer than others, but I'm gonna. It's important for you to listen to what you're about to hear. Okay, here's the first clip. Santander Group to benefit Santander Bank and a customers here in New York and Boston and other places. The scale we have. So, so we say we have in-market scale and global scale. The global scale is the fact that we're investing every year five billion euros in technology. We've committed to invest 20 billion over three, four years. That would make us the third largest bank in this country, or fourth, depending how you count, in terms of the size of our IT investment. And what it means is that if you think about your mobile banking app, right? Every Santander country until last year was investing two, three million in improving this. This is gonna be a commodity. Everybody's gonna use most people are going to use a, a, a banking app. So what we're now doing is we're building it together. What it means is that if globally, and this is more or less uh, a real number, we're investing 60, 70 million euros in our banking app, and we're investing three individually, building it together means we can actually save about 70%, 70%, and give you an amazing customer experience. So if you're a customer of Santander US, and I hope now that you're going to have to not all our countries have signed up, but the uh, U.S. is going to sign up after this, of course. Um, 
So you're actually going to get the, the global scale benefit of Santander, and I, some of you in the room told me about this uh, a few years ago, and, and we're actually doing it. Now, you might think, why didn't you do it before? You know, that seems really easy. Well, having a strategy is maybe not easy. Executing on a strategy, making people work together, that's my toughest job, as always. Because every single person in my team, every country manager thinks they're like it, right? <laughs> the best thing since Coca-Cola. <laughs> and it's true, it's true. So I now need to convince these 10 superstars to, if you want to be the number one bank in this country, and we do, we better work together. Now, the US has it easy, right, because they're small. But if you're in Brazil, and our Brazilian bank has doubled profits in three years, you know, 1.5 billion more profits in four years, they're doing a great job, they have 50 million customers. They need to believe also that to be better than the bigger bank in Brazil, usually we're number two or three, they have to do it across the group. So this is... Okay, so that's the first clip. So you see how, how, how important she sees this mobile app. Now let's go to the, uh, and she talks about Ripple all throughout this, and, and Brad Garlinghouse is actually in the um, crowd, and she points to him several times. So listen to this. For the next three years, we've committed $120 billion in, 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 uh, We just issued a green bond uh, last week for a billion euros. It was five times oversubscribed. So that's one area. I see Brad here from Ripple. You know, I think we're leaders, not the, I'd say, top three, four, just not to be maybe five, but maybe three. Top three in the world in terms of blockchain-based technologies. We have a great partnership with Ripple. So we think we can lead in terms of the automation, because don't forget, this is about automation. Blockchain is just one piece of the automation to make, uh, in this case, payments more effective, more, more transparent, faster, uh, and cheaper for the consumer. So there's a number of areas, both on retail and wholesale, where we can, you know, we can be uh, a leader, including in the U.S. Yeah, talk more about the technology and the innovation coming out of Santander now, because you've been a big backer of, of Ripple. You also recently uh, talked about uh, blockchain-based lending broadly, and you issued your first, the first blockchain bond. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a first, but again, it's uh, you know, let's there's a lot more to do. So we issued the first. It was a 20 million euro uh, bond where both the cash and the security leg were blockchain based, but also the way we did the payment, payment against delivery was on the blockchain. And that, that is a first. So we took out the clearing house, we took out the payment agent. So there's a lot of inefficiencies in what I call the, let's say the engine room, the infrastructure of payments. It's not, I mean, I'm not saying the banks are great, but a lot of it is not to do with us. It's to do with all the payment rails behind what we actually build upon. And so, uh, again, there's a number, uh, you haven't asked me about Libra yet, but. Uh, yes, so. Are the, you, tell me about Libra, F Facebook's <laughs> name. So, but, but just to finish on this point is no. that, <laughs> automation is, is, is the thing, you know, how do we automate to become so, so and, and I think uh, DLTs or distributed ledger technologies are, are gonna be one of the pieces that is gonna allow for much more efficient, faster, you know, the consumer wants everything 24, seven, 365, and that's what we're gonna be doing with this infrastructure change. Uh, so before going on to Libra, again, Ripple is helping us, and Brad is here tomorrow, so he'll tell you more about that. So we're working with them on OnePayFX, uh, which was, I think, the first, in this case, the first um, blockchain-based retail payments cross-border in the world. So for the moment, you need to be a customer of Santander UK or Poland. We're doing this between countries. It allows you to actually transfer money from one country to the other. In the case of the Eurozone, uh, same day. Uh, but we're also doing it with Chile and with other corridors. We've done 100,000 transactions. I think that's a number. Uh, since we launched, it's very popular. So as, as we have time, I'll tell you why we did this. So I have a son, my number three son. I always say this to them privately. He's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to say that. Yes. But you say it. 
So I'm on TV, so I hope they see this one day. <laughs> <laughs> He's my favorite for a reason. So he is always telling me as a consumer what doesn't work with banks and what works, okay? And he sends me emails all the time, and I love it. <laughs> so five years ago, he was studying at Georgetown, and he was um, moving to the UK, where I was actually six years ago, I was running. And he writes to me and says, look, you know, I'm a customer of Capital One in the US, and I'm gonna become a customer of Santander UK. So far, so good. And then he tells me, by the way, I have $1,000 I've saved, uh, and I'm not going to send it through Santander because you're horribly expensive. And I found this great company called TransferWise that charges me three pounds or five pounds, and you charge me 50. So I went to my team and I said, this is not acceptable. <laughs> so, you go, so you go and find me a way that I can offer my customers. By the way, it took us, and that is one of the things of regulation that we need to change because we could have done this much faster if we were a non-bank, okay? So that is why I say, and thanks Marie Jose for saying it, we should have activity-based regulation. And so please, and I, you know, I see here somebody from the journal, you know, look, just go and read the Financial Stability Board report on this, and they recommend, in the world of DLT and distributed technologies, you need activity-based supervision because this is super important. So it took us much longer, but what we eventually did is we found a great company like Ripple, we invested in Ripple, and together we launched this OnePayFX, which has been hugely successful. And by the way, in a few months, we're gonna launch PagoFX, open market in the App Store. You'll be able to go there. You don't have to be a Santander customer. Obviously, we hope you will be a Santander customer, but you'll have the flexibility of keeping your bank and using PagoFX, which in English sounds Paygo, in Spanish is Pago, P-A-G-O-F-X. Uh, U.S. is going to take a few more months. <coughs> when is it going to be in the U.S., Mr. Scott Howard? <laughs> you don't need to answer that in public, but in a year. Uh, and, and this is super exciting because I think this is exactly what consumers are demanding, you know? And, and so it's very important that we're able to deliver this as soon as we're able to. And if, you know, if, and I've written to all the governors, Mr. Carney, you know, the Fed and everybody on a side-by-side -side comparison of if you're doing payments, building a one pay FX and you're called Santander, you're doing payments and you're called XYZ company, how long it takes to develop, what it means in terms of compliance and trust. So. Okay, so there's one clip. I mean, the, this lady talks about Ripple so much throughout this that I had to find, I, I found at least four or five different clips here. And they're very interesting for you to hear, but you can hear the excitement in her voice. You can tell that she knows that Ripple is about, is changing the game right now. And so let's go, I'm going to go further and, and you'll, you'll hear what I'm talking about. She, she's, um, she is, there's nobody more bullish on Ripple than, than she is. Listen to this. I said what regulation means when markets get let's say, into a vol more volatile um, situation. And, and what about as things go more digital? I mean, you talked earlier about the digital wall wallet, about open banking. I mean, is there any risk to believe, is there any risk in that issue that recently happened with rates jumping to 10% overnight is telling us something is bad on the horizon, that uh, it could spark a, a bigger um, financial disruption than people expect? Let me just finish, uh, yes, so yeah, uh, digital wallets. Digital wallets is a hugely important change in consumer behavior. So this year, you're gonna have two billion people on the planet, two billion people with a digital wallet. And I don't think people realize what that means. I mean, it means that it's always on you and it's always on, right? So all your data is there. Now, when we talk about open banking, Open banking, i.e. opening up banks' information. We've done that in Europe. What it means is that we are now forced to give anybody that asks us, not just fintechs, but the big tech companies, your personal information. So if you, Maria, tick a, a box here, and you know I am a new company, fintech, whatever, or one of the big ones, I offer you free banking forever if you tick this box and in exchange, Santander, who's your bank until now, has to give me all your information for the past 30 years. I have to give it to that new player. Now, if we do the opposite question, I want to do that as Banco Santander, 
and I ask you to tick the box and ask your favorite, you know, where your social network or whatever information, they don't have to give it to me. Even though we have enough technology, AI, and all these other tools to actually give you a much better loan because that information is valuable. So it's a very asymmetric relationship. And as this comes to the US, I always say this to, to central bankers is, if you think about payments and data, it's different sides of the same coin. And so the question for all of us is, do you want all your payments and everything else you're doing in your life to be in the hands of you know, companies where you just ones and zeros and it's all about you know, engineering or do you want that to be somewhere you can trust that you're gonna have access to that data? But at the end of the day, it's also about understanding if you open up banking, you have to open up data in a symmetrical way, in a way that everybody can benefit because that is what is gonna be good for innovation, right? And at the end, we want innovation to come from as many places as possible. I have, by the way, it's about regulation, it's about competition and taxes. Santander Group paid 3.5 billion euros in taxes last year. We pay tax where we create value. One of the things we need to ask ourselves as a digital society is where is value being created, right? And therefore, where are we, you know, where, where, where should we be paying our taxes, corporate taxes, not sales and so on? It is a huge issue because, you know, if I can, our, our tax rate, by the way, is 34% effective tax rate. And most banks, effective. yeah, most, most banks in the world have very high tax rates. Um, if I had an extra 500 million, I could maybe support Ripple and another 10 companies. Yes, I'm not gonna give it all to you though. <laughs> but you definitely would get some of it. Um, you don't even need it now, but. Uh, so, so this is very, very important. You want all the players, whether they're new players or traditional sectors, and this affects all sectors of the economy. That's why, again, this, this paper by the FSB is important on payments, but you can ask yourself the same question on cars, homes, hotels, you know, transportation. And I do think... We Anyway, you you could hear there that she wants to invest even more money in Ripple, so she's <laughs> she's she's on board. Now let's go to there's one other clip that I found that is very interesting, and that is right in here. Both, right, and with fairness, and I think that is hugely important, and that's why I think U.S. can have a great, you know. That's a lot to say here. I, I want to end off with diversity and how, how wonderful uh, you're doing. But let me just ask you, you just triggered a thought because you've, you've uh, backed Ripple, you are backing small business. What kind of innovation do you see today out of Europe? Can you see a Google, a Ripple, uh, a Facebook being created in Europe today? It, there is no reason why not. So Europe has huge, you know, Europe is the number one destination of direct investment in the world, ahead of the US. Uh, we have great research, we have lots of great uh, engineers. By the way, even in Spain, we have great engineers and they're cheaper, so anybody here who wants to set up in Europe, invest in Spain. So what's please. stopping the innovation? <laughs> so, but just let me finish. Yeah. So, what we don't have is a single market, right? And so I've said many times, for Europe to succeed, we need to get on with the integration. Now, this is gonna lead to you asking me about Brexit. I'm not sure I'm gonna answer on that, but, so we need a more integrated Europe. As I said before, capital markets union, we don't have it, you know? And again, 70% of lending should not come from banks. That's why we're so excited about this new blockchain base because it lowers uh, capital markets cost. We need a common deposit insurance so when the next crisis comes, you know, we don't get a recession again in Europe. All this matters to innovation because if I wanna launch a company in the US, and again, correct me again, uh, Brad, tomorrow when you, this is important. I'm sure you don't face such a different regulation in Texas from New York from California, or at least not that different. This is huge, it's right? It's a good point, really good point. And so you can launch and you can be in the biggest economy. By the way, US and Europe, if they were really comparable, would not be that different. But if I wanna open, so we have launched the first fully digital bank in Europe uh, that is on the cloud, Open Bank different from open banking and it's a bit confusing. Uh, we just launched in Germany, we're gonna um, launch this bank in Germany uh, through the passporting agreement, but the tax laws are different. So that anyway, it, just about every single, every single thing she said, at some point she turns to Brad Garlinghauser is talking about Ripple. So you can tell how pumped up she is about Ripple. Now, 
Uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, this is from Bank XRP. Um, this is the app that they were actually talking about. Ripple, watch a, watch a transaction from start to finish on Ripple powered Santander, one pay FX. And, um, she's also doing the, the Pago FX, Pago FX. But this is a transaction actually on their platform using powered by Ripple. There's no sound to it, so you're just watching it more or less. But there's show you can you can see the world that we are are going into. And when when you're looking at things like this and you're and you're and you're watching a a woman who's as powerful as this lady and she, with a with one of the mega banks of the world. And, and it puts things in, when you have a bad day on coin market cap, this really puts things in perspective about where things are really going, what really matters. And it makes you understand the Glenn Hutchins thing when he says that that's just a distraction. And, and I'll, I'll hammer that point home in the next clip. Remember, at this, um, at this Economic Club of New York, um, she spoke. And then it, it was, it, you can tell the way that they had all these people just coming through that it's like they're trying to sell Ripple and what XRP is to these lords of finance. So I, I got a couple of clips and we've shown some of this before, but I, I found three good clips from Brad Garlinghouse that I think are applicable to right now. And the first one is this. This is really hits home with the, what's been going on with um, the, the stock markets of the world here recently. And the free market judges. Correct. Going back to your, they see some, some see it as a tradable asset. You guys don't look at it that way. I get it. Well, we see it as a tradable asset to solve an institutional liquidity yes. problem. Yes. Uh, so we, we definitely view it as a tradable asset. There's no doubt that, you know, we, we, we treat it as a currency in that regard. I just don't think that, I don't think any crypto, let alone XRP, is going to, you know, make inroads into solving that consumer use case. So, um, it, they see XRP as a way to solve an institutional liquidity problem. What do we have today? An institutional liquidity problem. Okay, let's go on to the next uh, clip right in here. Here we go. Hand somebody a dollar and everyone at the table agrees he handed in the dollar. The dollar moved mm -hmm. and everyone agrees it moved and we can agree that the consensus is that happened. The XRP ledgers have over 50 million ledger closes and we've never had a transaction unwound and, you know, it, it works. It's just a fundamentally different model for how it works. I'm glad you brought up the dollar again uh, because I want to transition, particularly for this audience of the Economic Club of New York, uh, China and other countries, but specifically China. China has completed a prototype, I don't know if you all know this, a prototype of a so-called China coin a digital currency, I believe it's backed by the Yuan. It is. And they are about to unleash their own network, similar to, you know, what we're talking about here. Are we behind in that here in America? I mean, the Fed is a skeptic when it comes to cryptocurrency. Yeah. The president is a skeptic. Uh, you have a lot of people who still don't quite understand it. You know, Singapore, which is considered a financial center of the world, very forward thinking when it comes to technology, that central banker has expressed a little bit of concern. Yeah. So let's, let's first understand like what stable coins are kind of uh, mm -hmm. central bank digital assets is kind of the, the, the way they're described. And so what the, the Chinese government is doing is that they are uh, apparently going to launch a central bank digital asset. Uh, I, let's go back to the thing I said about Starbucks earlier. What problem are we solving? So uh, I look at the Fed today, and I'm sure there are bankers here in the window or, or in the audience. And if you want to go and call on the Fed for liquidity, you go to the Fed window. You don't get cash; you get digits in a ledger. Mm -hmm. And so when it, you know, like I'm J.P. Morgan, and I go to the Fed. The Fed's saying, "Okay, great. Here, here's some sort of ledger change. It's already digitized." So I, I've actually been a little bit of a skeptic that central bank digital assets do much that we don't already do today. So you don't think the dollar should be tokenized? It already is. You think about it, like how many people here, like you look at your net worth statement on a bank account and like those are just digits. You know, it, yes, you could go to the bank and get cash, but frankly, if you're asking for any more than a few thousand dollars, you have to call in advance because they don't have the cash. So most of your, most of the US dollar is quote, I mean, you said tokenized, I would say digitized, 
there is a little bit of a dif difference, but I think we always have to go back to what problem are we trying to solve? Mm -hmm. If we're solving a problem or creating customer value, then I think it's great. The, the only argument I have seen around central bank digital assets is if they want to expand the Fed window from serving a small number of regulated institutions to a mass audience. If everybody here could go directly to the Fed and have an account with the Fed, yeah. well, that's kind of interesting. Now we just put the entire commercial banking business out of business. That doesn't sound like a very good that, idea. I'm feeling the room shivering at the moment. <laughs> uh, but I would also say, too, with China, they tend to have sometimes nefarious positions here. A China coin, if they ran it, they could see every financial transaction from everyone. They love that control. And on top of it, they could bypass U.S. sanctions with this. Well, the bypass point is an issue. And let me pause on that one for a second. I mean, I, people have made this argument before, and I'm like, look, make no mistake about it. The Chinese government already sees every transaction. So whether it's a digital asset, I mean, yes, there's lots of efforts to circumvent through cash, but they see a lot of the transactions. Would this actually enhance their ability? Okay. And then finally, I want to show you a part in this where he addresses why Ripple, uh, why XRP. And that is right in here, and then I'll drive the final point home. Here we go. Uh, this gentleman, right here. Hi, uh, Phil Bruno from McKinsey. Um, around the world, many uh, central banks and banking systems are setting up real-time payment systems. So you can move money from one account to the other in two seconds or less. Yep. And in Scandinavia this year, they're standing up a company called P27. So you can now move currency across border in four countries. Why don't we just link up these real-time payment systems and uh, be done with it? Yeah. Right? Why do we need Ripto or Ripple or cryptocurrencies? I think it's a great question. I'm going to answer it in two different ways. First, I'm going to say, uh, I imagine a number of people in here have a PayPal account and you probably have a Venmo account. Have you ever tried to move money from Venmo? By PayPal owns Venmo, just to be clear. Have you ever tried to move money from Venmo to PayPal? You can't do it. You have to go Venmo back to your bank and then back to PayPal. The, the, the reason why I start with that answer is, in a perfect world, what we, we see an interoperable payments network world of the future, where all payment networks are interoperable. The world we live in today, and I'm using PayPal and Venmo as the example, is highly not interoperable. What you're talking about, in the, you know, the US Fed and the faster payments, uh, that's a domestic clearing. You know, we actually think, yes, that would be fabulous. Actually, Ripple was one of the, the, the kind of leads on that task force. At some point, though, you have to go from the U.S. dollar to another currency. Uh, there are examples, in the, as you described, in uh, the Nordics that are coming together in small pockets. You know, the question is, can you do that across hundreds of countries or you know, a couple hundred countries and you know, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of different payment networks? We see a world where today the Internet of Information uses TCP, IP, and HTTP to enable interoperability across information networks. How do we enable interoperability across payment networks so that if I want to go from my BAML account to Paytm, the leading mobile wallet in India, and it's Mother's Day, and I send my mom 100 US dollars, that I can do that with no big deal. Today, to send that $100 to my mom in India you know, would be very expensive and very uncertain as to how it ever get to Paytm, a, the largest mobile wallet provider in India. So I, I view those as all positive developments. Uh, you know, some governments have some uh, domestic governments like Mexico's local clearing is way better than the United States. Uh, that's good. You know, now if we get into one with MoneyGram, we get into one bank in, in Mexico, we can get to any other bank in Mexico and sub one hour. That's way better than the United States. So I, I, I think we want to see that advancement. So there you go. Um, and, and what he, he, he made that comparison of TCPIP for information. And this is where all that ends, folks, right here, back to our, back to the timeline for the Internet of Value, right here. Uh, 2017 to 2020, Ripple becomes the standard for international money transfers between banks. ILP becomes the standard protocol for connecting banks, cash ledgers as a part of Ripple software. And then we go off into the sunset of a new financial system. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button. And tell your friends and family that it's all about the ILP. Everything else comes with it. Thank you for listening.